Shalom and welcome, everyone, and thank you for tuning in. I'm deeply grateful for your presence and your willingness to explore some of the most challenging and profound questions that touch our lives. Today, we begin a journey together to understand the nature of evil, the role of free will, and the potential for redemption through a relationship with God. This discussion aims to shed light on these complex topics and offer insights that may help guide us through our own spiritual and moral landscapes. Thank you for joining this important conversation and let's dive into these deep waters together. Why does God allow evil? Think about that for a moment. Innocent babies tragically lose their lives to crippling diseases. Individuals who have done no wrong are swept away by natural catastrophes and young lives are brutally cut short in acts of terror. In the face of such sorrow and injustice, the question arises, if God truly exists, why is our world plagued with illness, violence, and warfare? Where was God during the unspeakable horrors of the Holocaust in World War II? Why does he not step in to stop the wave of evil that seems to overwhelm us? Claiming God does not exist because of the evil in the world ironically weakens the very idea of evil itself. Without God, the foundation for objective morality dissolves leaving only subjective interpretations and personal opinions behind. Consider the naturalistic perspective, such as the evolution theory that promotes the survival of the fittest. Observing a lion in the act of preying upon a zebra during an African safari we do not label the lion as, quote, evil, or argue it should face imprisonment for its actions. Rather, we recognize it as a natural occurrence within the circle of life. Under evolutionary or atheistic views, humans are considered the same as animals lacking any moral distinction. Therefore, if a person were to abduct, murder, and commit cannibalism, this action could merely be seen as an expression of dominance by a stronger being over a weaker one, according to this worldview. This comparison clearly shows the failures of evolutionary theory and atheism in explaining the natural awareness of moral values and the distinctiveness of human actions compared to animal behavior. To highlight this point, consider the quote from the famous author and philosopher Fyodor Dostoevsky, who said, quote, If God does not exist, everything is permitted. End quote. This statement captures the crisis of moral relativism emerging from evolutionary theory and atheism. Without God, morality becomes flexible, shaped by personal or societal preferences rather than anchored in any universal truth. The Bible also addresses the unique moral status of humans in the book of Genesis chapter 1 
verse 27, where it states, quote, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. End quote. This biblical verse not only states the inherent worth of each individual, but also implies a moral framework that transcends evolutionary survival instincts. Another analogy to consider is that of a society governed only by the principle of, quote, might makes right. In such a society, laws and ethics would deteriorate into the desires of the powerful, leading inevitably to chaos and oppression. And this resembles a jungle, where only power decides what's right. A sharp difference from civilized societies where justice and morality are valued as ideals beyond just surviving. Imagine a society where the foundational belief is that human life has no intrinsic value or purpose beyond mere biological existence and survival. Here, the idea of, quote, progress becomes ambiguous. If life ultimately bears no purpose or significance beyond what we subjectively assign to it, the arguments for why it is, quote, good to help others lack a foundational basis in moral truth. They become dependent on collective human preferences, which could shift over time leading to a relativistic morality where actions are shaped by societal norms and personal benefits rather than any absolute sense of right and wrong. By highlighting these comparisons and references, we see how the theory of evolution and atheism struggle to explain moral differences that are naturally recognized and deeply valued in human societies. The implication is clear. Without God as the transcendent moral standard, there is no strong foundation for distinguishing right from wrong, leaving humanity lost in a sea of moral uncertainty. Reasons Why God Might Allow Suffering Conflicts, hatred, and violence are not phenomena that materialize from nothing. They originate from humanity itself. If God decided to eliminate all evil from the world, the simplest solution would be to eliminate humanity. Yet, is it possible that our purpose as human beings is only to experience joy without the difference of pain and suffering? Not necessarily, as these challenging experiences can also be transformative. The Bible tells us that our overall primary purpose is to develop a relationship with God. The saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, reflects a truth about human endurance. Hardship encourages growth and strength. It is through challenges and crisis that we not only test our character, but also have the opportunity to reshape our lives and priorities. As Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. powerfully stated, 
quote, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy, end quote. The story of Job in the Bible exemplifies how God permits suffering to draw us closer to him, encouraging dependence and seeking his presence. The existence of evil is not a mark of God's absence from the world, but a reflection of his absence in the lives of those who choose to turn away from him. From the beginning, as described in the book of Genesis, God gave humans free will, the ability to choose between good, love and kindness, and evil, selfishness and harm. And this ongoing internal struggle is what the Bible defines as sin, deeply ingrained and influencing our decisions. The butterfly effect theory suggests that small causes like minor choices can have large effects rippling through time and affecting generations. This concept is particularly relevant here as it highlights how our decisions, no matter how small, can shape our environment contribute to natural disasters and influence societal structures, often resulting in violence and conflict. Our individual actions, like the flutter of a butterfly's wings that might eventually influence weather patterns far away, resonate throughout our social and physical world illustrating the profound impact of our moral choices. We often blame other people for these problems, yet it is essential to realize that the potential for evil exists not only in those around us, but also within ourselves. This internal evil does not prove God's non-existence. Rather, it highlights our disconnection from Him. Rejecting God does not inherently lead to evil, nor does believing in Him guarantee perfection, as noted by Fyodor Dostoevsky. Quote, Denying God they will end by flooding the earth with blood, for blood cries out for blood." End quote. Jesus the Messiah himself warned about the cycle of violence and retribution, as recorded in the book of Matthew, chapter 26, verse 22, which states, quote, For all who draw the sword will die by the sword, End quote. This shows that our actions and their moral consequences are deeply connected, reflecting through our choices and their effects on the world. Stopping the Cycle of Evil The relentless cycle of revenge and violence that has plagued humanity throughout history persists even today. Jesus articulated a profound solution to this cycle in the New Testament, emphasizing the power of love over retaliation. In his teachings, found in the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 27 through 37, he outlines a revolutionary approach. Quote, Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those 
who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? But love your enemies, do good to them, and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because He is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven." End quote. Jesus' guideline, quote, do to others as you would have them do to you, embodies a universal principle. Envision a world where everyone behaves thoughtfully, prioritizing the well-being of others. How transformative could that be? The Apostle Paul further reinforces this notion in the book of Romans chapter 12 verse 17 through 21, urging us to avoid retaliation and to pursue peace. Quote, Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. End quote. The essence of the problem, therefore, lies within us, not outside. Even if all weapons were to vanish, the underlying human tendency for conflict would find other outlets, such as sticks and stones. It is an internal battle, as the Apostle James suggests a new, higher moral standard in the book of James, chapter 4, verse 17. Quote, If anyone, then, knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. End quote. James challenges us not only to avoid harming others, but to actively do good, demonstrating consideration and placing others' needs above our own. The New Testament implies that failing to act when we have the opportunity to do good is a sin against God. Leo Tolstoy, the renowned Russian author, deeply noted, quote, Everyone thinks of changing the world, but no one thinks of changing himself, end quote. This calls us to self-reflection before blaming others or God for the evils in the world. True change begins from within, and achieving world peace 
starts with inner peace and self-examination. The Holocaust, along with countless other atrocities throughout history, exemplifies the destructive nature inherent in all humans. My own ancestors, like many others, suffered losses during the Holocaust. Yet, this event is only one of numerous instances where one group sought to annihilate another, demonstrating a widespread issue within human nature. Over the past century alone, hundreds of millions have perished due to this deep-seated tendency for violence. The challenge, therefore, is to transform ourselves to heal the world. The Limitations of Legalistic Religion It's crucial to acknowledge that we do not see religion as the ultimate solution. Practices such as wearing specific garments or following Jewish ritualistic customs, such as binding leather straps around one's arm, are not sufficient remedies for the moral fractures in human hearts. Such religious observances can often end up dividing rather than uniting people. In contrast, a genuine relationship with God tends to bring people closer together. While it is essential to honor and mourn the six million lives lost during the Holocaust, it is also vital to recognize the endurance of those who survived. Despite such profound evil, the continued existence of the people of Israel serves as a testament to God's enduring promises. However, history has shown us that even the best intentions, humans, including those who are religious, can commit grievous acts. A striking example comes from Maimonides, a revered rabbi in Jewish history who advocated extreme measures against those who rejected rabbinic authority, stating, quote, a person who does not acknowledge the oral law is not the rebellious elder mentioned in the Torah. Instead, he is one of the heretics and he should be put to death by any person. All of these are not considered as members of the Jewish people. There is no need for witnesses, a warning, or judges for them to be executed. Instead, whoever kills them performs a great commandment and removes an obstacle from people at large." End quote. Laws of Rebels 3 this perspective highlights a dangerous tendency within religious frameworks where zeal can lead to justifying violence, illustrating that the human heart, when convinced of its righteousness, can be relentless. This serves as a clear reminder that the trust in our own hearts can be misplaced and that true moral guidance requires a deeper personal engagement with God rather than mere commitment to religious dogma. Therefore, the answer to evil and suffering is not found in religious legalism, which can lead to division and even violence, but in cultivating a heartfelt, authentic relationship with God that transcends ritualistic observances 
and brings about genuine moral transformation and unity among people. The Purpose of Free Will God's allowance of evil in the world serves as a dual purpose. It not only affirms the complete free will of human beings, but also establishes a necessary distinction through which we can comprehend goodness. Just as darkness lets us appreciate light and cold helps us understand warmth, the presence of evil sharpens our perception of good. This duality is crucial for us to recognize and choose the path of righteousness. It's important to realize that the root of much pain and suffering lies within us, humanity itself. If the elimination of all evil was the goal, it would require nothing less than the eradication of all human life. This harsh reality highlights our incapacity to solve the problem of evil on our own. Instead, we require a savior whose power surpasses our own one who can not only forgive the multitude of poor decisions we have made, but can also heal our broken spirits and set a new example for us to follow. This is the central theme of the Messiah and the teachings of the New Testament. By presenting a figure of salvation, the New Testament addresses the profound need for an external force capable of guiding humanity beyond its inherent flaws and towards a renewal of moral and spiritual integrity. And this concept emphasizes that while we have the freedom to choose, our choices often lead us astray necessitating divine intervention to restore what has been damaged by human error. Therefore, the existence of free will and evil is closely tied to our learning, growth, and ultimate redemption through Jesus the Messiah, offering us not just the knowledge of good versus evil, but also the way to choose good over evil. In this exploration of evil, free will, and divine purpose, we've uncovered the profound complexities that shape our moral landscape. The existence of evil, while a source of immense suffering, also serves as a motivator for understanding and choosing good. It tests our character and enriches our spiritual journey, emphasizing that the freedom to choose is a fundamental aspect of our humanity. We've seen that while religion alone cannot solve the deep-rooted issues of evil, a personal relationship with God can guide us towards reconciliation and moral clarity. This relationship, strengthened by the teachings of the New Testament and the example of Jesus the Messiah, offers a path to not only recognize good from evil, but to actively choose the good, even in the face of overwhelming darkness. Thank you for taking the time to engage with these thoughts and reflections. If you found this discussion enlightening or thought-provoking, please consider sharing it with others who might also benefit from these insights. Please subscribe to my channel for more explorations into 
meaningful and complex topics like this one. Together, let's continue to seek understanding and encourage discussions that lead to growth and spiritual enrichment. Remember, always question, always examine, and always hold on to what is good. And now, the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, Yeshua, our Lord, God, and Savior, I pray. Amen.